Okay, guys, we're almost there. Home stretch, guys. We can do it. Um, so this is my first lecture with new memory in my computer. So let's see if it's really a memory issue. <laughs> the guy installed it, and then he said, well, it still happens. We'll have to re-image your computer. And I was like, okay. But it has so much memory on it now that, like, I can see what's really each, each of your genomes and assemble it on <laughs> It's like its own server. Um, okay. Click business. Notebooks will be collected on Tuesday. Um, questions I keep answering to, for people, but people still keep emailing me. Do I need to take the final exam? No. Don't take it. Don't take it. If you're happy with your grade, don't take it. Please don't take it. Um, someone said to me, but I feel bad. Why do you feel bad? You are doing me a favor. <laughs> I am saying thank you. It doesn't make me feel like a useful person to have you take my final. And what makes me mad is when a smart student doesn't study and takes it because they know they're going to drop it and makes me grade the final that they didn't put any effort into. So please, if you're happy with your grade, don't take it. It's the final exam cumulative, not really, but kind of as you'll see today. Do we have a quiz this week? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so take five minutes to write. What are CDKs? And discuss four mechanisms of CDK resolution.
Okay, guys. Abby. Ah, there you are. Uh huh. Great. Okay. Cycle dependent kinases activated by binding cyclins involved in cell cycle regulation. Okay, so four mechanisms of CDK regulation. Did you come up with a few of them? Okay, how about one of them? Um, cyclin right, so there's one binding by cyclins. CDKs are off unless bound by cyclins. Who wants to add to that? Yes? Um, when you have V1, that's the kinase, and that works to inhibit the CDK. So negative, negative regulation by V1. Right, and then there's also CBC25, which is a phosphatase that takes off that kinase, so it makes it back in the active form. Right, CBC25 removes that, that phosphate group, reverses the activity of V1. It makes it active again. Okay. How about another one? Yep. CAK, what does that do? So it activates, it's an activating phosphorylation, right? So CAK kinase that changes the conformation of CDK, so it's completely active. How about another one? Yep. CKI, right, what is that? <clears throat> right, inhibitor protein that binds and inhibits the cyclokinase complex. Good. That's good. Did I miss anything? <coughs> if you wanted to go deeper, you could say presence of the PKs, the presence of cyclins, but it kind of, you know, gets to be overkill there. But so those are your main mechanisms of regulation. Okay, this is so far what's going to be on the final leftovers from cytoskeleton. Um, ways to study cell cycle, cyclin CDKs, mechanisms for regulation, kinases, phosphatases, ubiquitin ligases. So that's another mechanism for regulation. Um, regulation of assays we spoke about the other day. Why DNA replication happens only once per cell cycle. And that's focusing on the role of APC and SCDK and formation of the ORC and pre-RC and then activation of um, replication. Okay, so M phase. Let's start with M phase. So I want you to notice these cyclins are rising and falling in different phases of the cell cycle, right? So that's the whole way they're being regulated. The kinases are being regulated. So notice M cyclin, which is the green one, starts to build up as early as the end of S phase, right? We don't need it until the beginning of M phase. Teens keep it off, right? Even though the cyclin's there, you need to keep that CDK off. Um, and so that's where V1 comes in. So you have these M CDK, these cyclin CDK complexes. That are slight that you that would be active because you've got your cyclin that combined to your kinase, but due to the activity of V1, you have that inhibitory phos phosphate group that's added. And then when it's time for that cyclin CDK complex to become activated in the beginning of M phase, then CDC25, that phosphatase, can come remove that inhibitory phosphate group, and then you have your active. Um, CDK. So that's what's going to happen um, at the start of mitosis. So you get that activation of your M cyclin CDK. Okay, so what, so all of these, we're talking a lot about these CDKs that are activated at different points of the cell cycle. And you always need to be thinking of it in the context of their kinases. Well, what are they phosphorylating, right? Who cares that a CDK is active if you don't think about what target proteins are being phosphorylated, right? So I want you to think about what happens in mitosis, right? One of the first things that happens is chromosomes condense, right? 
Why do chromosomes condense? Easier. Easier to separate, right? What does chromo- your um, DNA look like when you don't have condensed chromo- chromosomes? It's a big mess. I always give the example of spaghetti. Take a big mess of spaghetti with no olive oil or anything. You take the fork and you go to pick it up and it's a day. And if you try to separate it, you break it, right? Broken DNA is bad. Would we agree? Great. So we're going to separate our chromosomes. It would be good to condense them first. Um, and so this is accomplished by condensin, which is a protein, which binds to the DNA and helps to condense the chromatin um, into these chromosomes. That's condensed chromosomes right there. And those are that's activated through phosphorylation by MCDK. So what's one of the targets of MCDK? Condensin. Does that make sense that MCDK is going to activate chromosomal condensation? Kind of, because you're in mitosis. Right? If that was activated in S phase, would that be good? No, you can't really replicate your DNA when it's condensed like this, can you? No. Great. Um, what else does MTDK do? It also activates mitotic spindle assembly. Also makes sense, right? This is a process that needs to happen in mitosis. So it makes sense that it would be not turned on until MCDK is active. Right, so just to remind you, the mitotic spindle, if you've got your centrosomes that were duplicated, and then you have three kinds of microtubules, right? You've got your astral microtubules that are kind of sticking to the periphery. You've got your kinetochore microtubules that are binding to the kinetochores of your sister chromatids. And then you've got your interpolar microtubules that are um, interacting with each other and kind of helping to position the microtubules. And you don't only need mitotic spin, like, so there are many stages that happen to kind of get to, to the point of metaphase to amphase, right? First, you have to assemble your mitotic spindle, and you have to position it. Then you have to, it has to interact with chromosomes. It has to line up chromosomes. And then we talk about that metaphase to amphase, that separation of the chromosomes. There's a, there's a lot that needs to happen here. And this is where, when I say, you have to find that's not cumulative, but it kind of is. Well, this is all about this side of the cells. Yeah, right? So we're talking about mitotic cells. Yeah. So if you imagine the cell kind of drawn around here, those astral microtubules are kind of poking out to the periphery of the cell, like to the cell cortex. And they're kind of pushing against the cell membrane. Cortex and they're also interacting with um, motor proteins that help to kind of pull the, the poles where they need to be. Yep. Okay. So let's go through spindle assembly. Yes. Don't they also keep like the organelles away from the picture that I'm just using? Like, do the my, do, <coughs> does the mitotic spindle also keep the organelles out of the way? Yeah. Oh, do they do the astral microtubules also keep the organelles out of the way? Yeah. Um, I don't. You know, I don't know that. Have you learned that before? No, I'm just saying. Because you know what? No, that's a really great. I have never thought. This is why I love students because you guys make me think about things that I don't think about. So I've always just kind of. I always and 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 this is what we all do. We all kind of like think of processes in a box. But you're right. This is happening in a cell full of organelles. <laughs> Right? And clearly, you don't want to like be trying to separate your chromosomes amidst the ER, and, which is huge, right? And that, which actually is going to probably change its structure a little bit because your nuclear envelope has gone away, right? Um, so I don't know exactly how that's regulated, but you must assume that organelles are kind of out of the way in some way. Either that or I don't know. I like that. Um, so you're thinking maybe the astral microtubules play a role in that? Because so they're pushing? Outside. Maybe, I don't know. There's a hypothesis. Test that one. That's a good immunofluorescence assay, right? All you have to do is label all of your organelles and look interphase versus mitosis versus different phases of mitosis. See where your different microtubules are. Yep. I'm sure it's known. Um, okay. 
spindle assembly, right? So this spindle assembly is dependent upon motor proteins, right? So you're having to move things around. Mostly um, motor proteins of kinesin and dynin. So you've got dynin here, which is associating with the microtubule and the cell cortex. And it's helping to organize microtubules and pull the central jumps apart. Because remember, it's walking um, to the minus end. You also have um, these different kinesins. So you've got 4 and 10. These are also called chromokinesins. And they're going to bind to microtubules, and they're going to bind to the sister chromatids, and they're going to push the chromosome away from the poles. So they kind of grab onto the sister chromatids all on the side, and they kind of help to um, um, move them to the center. You also have kinesin 5, which is sliding micro microtubules past each other because it's got motor domains on either side, so it's kind of sliding those microtubules, helping to position the poles at either end. And then you also have kinesin-14, which is also doing that. Um, and so what does this have to do with MCDK? Well, MCDK and some of the other mitotic kinases phosphorylate kinesin-5 and some of these other components. And so that also activates these proteins so that they can help to assemble the microtubules. So remember, all these CDKs have a ton of targets, and it kind of makes sense that they would be activating target proteins involved in a mitotic process. Right? Um, so then there's also a G1S CDK, and that, that CDK is actually involved in initiating centrosome duplication. <laughs> and it, it's a semi-conservative method of duplication, Kind of similar to DNA replication. Um, and you know, you go from in G1 to S, you actually start that duplication. So that what, by the time you get to M, you're able to start assembling your, your mitotic spindle. Um, so I just said to you, spindle assemblies dependent upon microtubule motor proteins. Right? So um, you've got your dynin and your kinesins. So dynin is promoting centrosome separation and increasing spindle length. Kinesin 14 and 5 are pushing the spindles apart. And there's these opposing forces of pushing and pulling of these different proteins that results in the correct spindle length and positioning. So in this picture here, what we're looking at is the role of these different motor proteins in regulating spindle length. And so it's this balance between kinesin 14, or actually um, also called CARB3P in yeast, which is minus end walking, and kinesin 5, which is plus end walking. Um, it's that balance of the activity of both of those where you have the pushing and pulling that results in a, a mitotic spindle of the appropriate length. Right? That's important, right? You don't want mitotic spindle where, you know, each pole is in the right place, let's say, but your, you know, your microtubules extend all the way to the other side of the cell and aren't ever going to catch those chromosomes, right? And so just another area of interest is in kinesin, kinesin 5 is phosphorylated and activated by MCDK and Aurora A kinase, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, and that's or a kinase is negative regulation of kinesin 5 when you have inappropriate attachment of your microtubules to um, uh, your chromosome. Any questions? I know I'm kind of fine, just trying to get everything in. Everyone's happy? Okay. You know what I'd really love? I would love to finish everything so that we barely have a lecture on Tuesday. Wouldn't it be nice? Yeah, I don't think it's gonna happen, but we're gonna try to <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna try to make we're gonna try to well, we're gonna try to make for a really short lecture on Tuesday. That's my goal. My goal. We all have goals. I hope. Okay. So let's talk for a minute. Can we just talk about positioning of microtubule, uh, the mitotic spindle? Let's talk about microtubule stability, 
right? Um, so are microtubules more or less stable in mitosis? Less. Less. There's a lot more capacity. Yeah. So what determines microtubule stability in the cell? Catastrophe factors, and what else? <coughs> MAP proteins. Remember we learned about these stabilizing MAP proteins and catastrophe factors. Oh my god, did you guys think you were done? Huh? Capping proteins? No, not really. Capping proteins would be more we're talking. So you're with capping proteins we're more talking about acne a lot of the time. And then we're more talking about um, proteins that actually cover the ends, right? Um, here, it's more of the catastrophe factors and the MAP proteins um, that stabilize. Um, so, how does MCDK regulate microtubule stability? That's the question here. Okay. So, <clears throat> this, this picture here out of the textbook is showing you um, what they did is they took Xenopus egg extract, egg extract, um, incubated with centrosomes and fluorescent tubuli. So in the egg act extract, you have all the proteins, right? And so if you have an interphase extract, you'll have all the proteins that are active in the interphase. If you have a mitotic extract, you're going to have all the proteins that are active in mitosis, right? And so here they're showing the number of catastrophes per minute. And here they're showing um, what it looks like. And so you have very few catastrophes per minute in interphase, but in mitotic extract, you have more. And so then they wanted to kind of study what kind of proteins are involved, and you guys just predicted what these proteins are. And so if they take the mitotic extract, so that's this one, and they deplete all the maps, the stabilizing maps, what's going to happen? Huh? No microtubules, all catastrophe. If you take away all your stabilizing proteins and you only have catastrophe vectors, you get catastrophe, right? And so that's what that little dot is showing. It's just a centrism. If you take your mitotic extract and you deplete maps and catastrophe factors, then you have actually a little bit more stability. Um, but then you're more being regulate, regulated by some of the other accessory proteins. And so the point is, you've got this balance between stabilizing maps and catastrophe factors that affect um, catastrophe frequency and uh, microtubule length. And in mitosis, you have um, many more catastrophes. They're much more dynamic. And it kind of makes sense when you consider the fact that when you're assembling your mitotic spindle, you have this constant growing and shrinking because you're trying to position yourself, you're trying to grab onto those chromosomes, all of that needs to happen. Um, so some other things to think about. Um, the mitotic chromosomes themselves promote spindle assembly. So RAM GTP, do you guys remember RAM? What do you guys remember about RAM? Molecular switch, GTP binding protein, what else? What's it involved with? That's RAS. RAN. RAN. I heard something targeting. Targeting for what? Where was? No, that's RAS. Nuclear. Nuclear import. It's going to make sense that it's in the nucleus and associated with chromatin, right? Remember that um, RAN gap bound, bound to chromatin? Think back, think back. I know you guys forgot it all. Um, so RAN GTP is activated by chromatin bound gaps. So we knew that already from the beginning of the semester. And so not only is it involved in the release of proteins that are imported into the nucleus and the um, export of proteins also. Um, it's also, it has another role, it's also involved in stimulating nucleation and stabilization of microtubules around the chromosome. 
So um, you're going to get nucleation, and then you'll get these motor proteins that are going to bind and help to kind of um, make the, the microtubules parallel. And then you're going to get um, interaction between your mitotic spindle um, and motor proteins in the chromosome. And then other motor proteins are going to help focus the poles, get them to where they need to be, get the chromosomes lined up. Now this specifically is done in um, a system that does not have um, spindle poles. But it's kind of a similar, it's kind of um, a good way to think about how motor proteins are involved in focusing the mitotic spindle and orienting the chromosomes correctly. So the microtubules of the mitotic spindle, were, they attach to the chromosomes at the kinetochore. And so the kinetochore, so people always say the microtubules attach to the centrum here, right? People always want to say that. That's the right location. So the centromere is a bit of a chromosome that has a certain sequence of DNA where the kinetic core assembles. So think of it this way. You've got your centromere, kinetic core binds, and that's where your microtubules bind. And it's your kinetic core microtubules, remember the words from kinds we talked about, that are going to bind to the kinetic core. Question? Okay, so the kinetic core attaches to the plus end of the spindle microtubules. It looks like a collar that kind of is around the microtubules and then also attaches to the mitotic spindle. So you can imagine with how this looks that what you're going to have is catastrophe when it's time to actually separate your, mitotic, uh, your chromosomes and this collar is going to kind of slide back towards the pole while you have this catastrophe. So all these microtubules at the plus end, those are going to kind of come apart and dissociate. And then this is going to slide down that way. And then this is attached to your chromosome. So it's going to kind of help. To, it's going to play a major role in separating sister chromatids. Um, so you have to also, so another thing to keep in mind is you need, the cell needs to attach microtubules to chromosomes um, correctly, right? And so that's sensed by sensing the tension between microtubules and, and the sister chromatids. And so what am I talking about? Um, I think I have a slide there. Okay, so in just a second we'll, we'll go back to that. So really what you have is this kind of search and capture process where you've got your sister chromatids sitting there in your cell, and then you've got this kind of um, constant dynamic instability of your mitotic spindle, and then you're going to have binding of your mitotic spindle to the um, kinetic core on the side, and then a motor protein is going to kind of drag it in, where then a kinetic core microtubule will attach to it. So it's kind of like grab it, bring it, bring it in, bind to the kinetic core. And so, but then you know you have to keep in mind there are two poles, so they both have to attach in the right place. You don't want to have a situation like this, where only one spindle attaches, or where you have um, two kinetic core microtubules from the same mitotic spindle attaching to both sides. Or where you've got um, microtubules from opposite spindle poles attaching to the wrong side. In all of those situations, you're not going to actually get proper separation of your chromosomes. And so what you need to have is this attachment where each pole has a kinetic core microtubule that attaches to the correct sister chromosome. That's logical, right? Probably never thought about. Who was thinking about this last night in preparation for today? <laughs> Someone posted on Facebook. Oh, Facebook is like the death of me. I hate it. Who hates Facebook? Who loves it and dies on it? Okay, I kind of hate its existence because it makes me look at it. 
They're always like loopy. Um, someone posted a thing and it was like, you know, reasons, like the top five million reasons you know you've been in the lab too long. <laughs> number one, number one, I loved, it had me laughing. It was like, you use aliquot in normal everyday conversation. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going to aliquot the leftovers into two Tupperware. <laughs> Sorry, I was just thinking about the weird things you think about. <laughs> okay. So there has to be a mechanism of regulation, because as we all know, if the mitotic spindle is not properly attached to the chromosome, you have a checkpoint that's going to be triggered, and you're going to halt cell cycle between metaphase and anaphase. So this has to be regulated, this has to be sensed in some way, and it's through sensing the tension. Um, so if the microtubules are properly attached, to the kinetic core, then you'll get depolymerization at the plus end of these kinetic core microtubules. And that is, that's one of the major things that, that pulls the chromosome towards the pole. In some cells, you'll all, also have what's called microtubule flux, um, where you've got um, um, tubulin removed from the minus end and being added to the plus end. Um, so then the other thing to think about is, um, where is that? I'm not happy. I'm missing a slide. That, 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 that. Okay. Why is that there? Hmm. Okay, well, we'll come back to sensing the incorrect attachment in a minute. Okay, so now you've got your um, sister chromatids hopefully properly attached to your mitotic spindle, right? So here's metaphase, and then you've got anaphase. You have that separation of your sister primitives. And so that transition is triggered by APC. Remember what APC is? Anaphase promoting complex. Oh my god, it's promoting anaphase. So, novel. Um, Right, so something that I somehow did not tell you during this lecture is that sister chromatids are held together by cohesin. People always think they're held together by the centrism. They're not held together specifically and only by the centrism. One of the major things that is holding them together are these proteins called cohesin. And so these need to be cleaved prior to uh, and phase, because you're not going to be able to separate your sister chromatids if they're attached. And that's done by an enzyme called separates. Also, another thing you should be able to remember pretty easily is it's called separates. Every now and then, the scientists do us a favor by naming something like this, not ABCD, one, two, three. So, so um, MTK, so remember we're talking about things that MTK does. One of the other things it does is it activates um, APC. And it activates through phosphorylation and CDC20, that coactivator interaction. So now you have an active APC. There's your inactive APC, there's CDC20. They come together, they're active. So in G2, you've got your... Um, sister chromatids bound by cohesin. <coughs> and then as then you're going to go through M phase, and then at some point in M phase, you need to separate. Right? You're going to line up those chromosomes and metaphase, and then you need to separate. And so one of the things that APC does is it binds to and degrades this protein called securin. And securin is an inhibitor of separate. Securin secures separate. Right? That's another way to remember it. They kind of, this is a nice mechanism. This is all words that are related to what it does. Degrade securin that activates separase. So now separase is active and it can cleave those cohesins. So you can get up to circumstance se separation. So um, MCDK activates APC. How does this create a negative feedback loop? What else do you remember APC degrading? 
feminine, but we're talking about how it's a negative feedback loop. So what it also is very, yep. Feminine, so I heard feminine, but what's what's cyclin? Does it degrade that might help with exiting my system? Huh? M cyclin. So one of the requirements for, for exiting mitosis is degradation of M cyclin and turning off M C D K. And so APC gets turned on by M C D K and then it shuts itself off. And so it degrades M cyclin and then will turn off. And then that in part allows for exit from mitosis. If you have high levels of M C uh, M cyclin, M C K activity, you can't exit mitosis. Yes. Securin is an inhibitor of suffering. So it keeps separate. So it keeps it inactive. And so you would want securin to be present and interacting with separates until you need it, right? What happens if APC accidentally gets activated and securin accidentally gets degraded in S phase? Your chromosomes wouldn't be paired. Your sister chromatids wouldn't be together. So how are you going to make sure that one of each chromosome goes to each cell, each daughter cell, if they're not together? Then it's chaos. You've got chaos. Horrible. That's why there's all these, these um, things that happen that prevent the cell cycle from moving forward. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so remember I was saying you need to make sure that the mitotic spindle is correctly attached to the sister chromatids. If it's incorrectly attached, and that's sensed by the tension, the tension is sensed between the mitotic spindle and the, and the um, sister chromatids, um, then you need, you need to, you, well, you'll, you'll basically the, the spindle assembly checkpoint will be triggered. Um, and so, if that happens, then what happens is MAD2 will bind to unattached kinetic force. So it's a sensor. Well, I'm very frustrated because I really want to have a slide about Aurora kinase right here. Okay, so I'm going to just tell you. So there's that Aurora B kinase that I mentioned a while ago. And its job is to phosphorylate and detach incorrectly attached um, microtubules from the metaphor. So if you've got incorrect attachment, it will phosphorylate it, detach. I'm sure it'll come up at some point. For some reason, the order of this is not making me happy today. Uh, and believe it or not, I spent an hour going through this lecture. So let's say you've got, you, so Aura B kinase keeps phosphorylating and detaching in an effort to correctly attach the mitotic spindle to the chromosome, and something's wrong. It's not attaching properly. Well, so then what's going to happen is MAD2, which is another protein, is going to come and bind to these unattached kinetophores. Because when you don't have your mitotic spindle attached to your kinetophore, then you have an unattached kinetophore, and you cannot move forward. If you move forward with chromosome segregation, then you're going to have unequal chromosomes in each daughter cell, and then you'll have bad things happen. So this is why you trigger a, a checkpoint. And one of the things that happens is MAD2 binds to unattached kinetophores and inhibits APC. Remember, <coughs> APC activates separate. <coughs> to cleave those cohesins to allow chromosome segregation. So you want to keep that APC off until you are ready, because you don't want to segregate chromosomes when the rock, when the spindle is attached incorrectly. Does this make sense? I find that I love self cycle because it's so mechanistic, but I also find that what makes it very challenging to learn because you've got to keep in mind all these different players and what's happening with them. So if you like doing logic puzzles and stuff like that, this is probably fine for you. Um, if you don't, then it's going to be So drugs, there are drugs like Taxol, 
that to stabilize microtubules, right? We learned about that before. So um, they're just cancer drugs because they inhibit cell cycle, right? So how does that work? So with everything I just told you, you can stabilize microtubules. If your microtubules are stabilized, you're probably going to have unattached metaphors, right? And so then you'll probably get MAD2 binding and the inhibition of APC, and you won't be able to transition from metaphase to anaphase, and then cell cycle arrest. So in this picture, we're showing the mitotic spindle is green, the DNA is always is blue, and MAD2 is in red. So you can see these chromosomes are all lined up perfectly fine, but this one's not. And so that one's been bound by MAD2. Um, that means that the spindle checkpoint is being, is being triggered. APC is being turned off, so no chromosomes will be separated until this is fixed. So you'll either get cell cycle arrest or apoptosis. So you're supposed to prevent things from going wrong, right? So last year someone wanted a full-on mechanism of how MAD2 inhibits APC. So I put in this slide, uh, and it's just for those of you who are like, um, and it's basically what happens is MAD2 inhibits APC CDC20 interaction by recruiting other proteins. So let's see. So normally you're going to have APC and CDC20 and it's active, right? And so it's transferring ubiquitin to this blue line, which is going to be a protein. And that's all this protein. Anyways. <laughs> it's funny because all the other proteins in this picture are like globular structures. Yet the protein here is like a, like it's like those like it's like a hundred amino acids of chaos. Um, anyway, so normally you have ubiquitination and then you get degradation. But so if MAD two is bound to metaphors, <coughs> what's going to happen is it's going to come and it's going to bind and then recruits these other proteins, MAD3 and BUB3. Don't worry about memorizing this. This is just for your love of science. Um, and they're going to bind um, pretty much in the location where the substrate is bind. So now the substrate, the protein that should be ubiquinated, can no longer bind. Um, and so then you're going to have this um, the blocking of ubiquination. So that's how um, um, APC is. Okay. okay, so chromosomes are going to separate through shortening of the kinetochore microtubule and sliding of these interpolar microtubules, resulting in pushing. So there's two things happening, right? One is that your kinetochore microtubules are going to have that catastrophe. They're going to separate and move towards the poles. And then you're also going to have those interpolar microtubules that are being slid away from each other by the motor proteins that are going to push the pole further apart. Remember, there's anaphase A and B. Okay, so what's next? Cytokinesis. It looks like a peach, doesn't it? James from the giant peach. <laughs> I just watched that recently. I'm surprised I haven't seen it before. It's scary. It's a good movie. Well, so it is scary. I tried reading that book to my kids when they were like four, and that was a faux pas. I always do that. I give them things they're not ready for. It freaks them out. I had them watch The Never Ending Story. I don't even remember what it was when they were way too But anyways, anyways, traumatized. But but it was a good movie. Sorry, can you say? Um, okay, so. We just did metaphase, then we did anaphase, right? So during anaphase, actin and myosin 2, oh god, here she goes again. Actin and myosin 2 reorganize to form this contractile ring, right? So do you guys remember this? Contractile ring, Right? So they're going to localize at that, at that, um, basically what's going to become the cleavage furrow inside of kinesis. So actin is red, myosin is green. So you can kind of see there's still a little actin at the cortex, but most of it is localized to the contractile ring with myosin. 
Um, so what's the mechanism that regulates this? Do you guys remember anything about that? What do you guys remember about actin recruitment of actin to certain places? Yep. Isn't it the formants make the bundles? Okay, so there's going to be formants, right? So you need to nucleate actin, formants make bundles. What recruits proteins to what locations? Huh? What recruits um, proteins to whatever location they need to be in in order to nucleate in that location? Yep. Um, well, motor proteins are going to be involved in the contraction. What else? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more like right now in less of a dance music kind of mood, more of a nice, like, ambient music kind of mood. Let's put on the ambient music. <laughs> they sound like they need to rock out. Remember those row proteins? Yeah. Row proteins. I was hoping someone would be like, no. Remember that GTP binding protein? Um, and that those are those, those molecular switches that are going to use the on nucleation of actin and um, other proteins, other accessory proteins involved in whatever function needs to happen. And so in the case of contractile ring assembly, you've got your, um, your row becomes activated, and that activates formins, and um, row-activated kinases, other kinases, that will then phosphorylate this myosin light chain. Remember, there's that regulatory light chain that's folded up, but then you get phosphorylation and folds down, you can get that assembly um, for contractile um, um, Activity. Um, so remember, you need your GAF and your GAF. Yep. It's all coming together, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's our contractile ring. Obviously, now our, our cells have separated into our two daughter cells. And so now we need to go into G1. And so the reason I have APC here for G1 is because I want you to acknowledge the fact that APC has two different kinds of activating proteins, one CDP20, one CDH1, and um, actually what happens <laughs> in M phase, at, at the end of M phase, M cyclin goes away because it's been degraded by APC, you exit M phase, but you still do need to keep APC on to go into G1. And so there's another activator protein called CDH1 that's triggered by a different cyclin CDK that um, kind of takes over keeping ABC active. Because uh, remember, you need to keep ABC active because what is ABC degrade? Geminin, because remember, you're about to set up for S phase all over again. Okay. So this is kind of what I just said to you. So entry into G1 requires low MTBK activity. You need your um, cyclin to be degraded. Um, you need low MTBK activity. But MTBK activates and is degraded by APC. So you're looking at this quandary of how to keep APC on when you're degrading its activator. And so um, basically what it comes down to is the fact that you're going to have... Um, um, that CDH1, that other activator of APC is going to come into play. Right. So here's CDH1. So what? So in G1, you're going to get CDH1. That's going to keep APC on. Um, what am I trying to say here? CDH1 keeps APC active. Oh, so then you're also going to get CKI expression also increasing after mitosis, and so that's going to keep CDK activity low. So you want in G1, in order to have a G1 phase, you need low CDK activity. So CKI helps keep expressed at higher levels to keep that 
Um, and then also M size and transcription is lower because you need lower MCK activity. And so that happens in mycosis also. So not only are you going to degrade your M cyclin to turn off your MCDK at the end of mitosis, but also transcription is lower, so you're not making more. And so then you can go into D1. And so then you're going to start all over again. And so I just want you to keep in mind that you're going to have this kind of back and forth between ABC because those FCI, those um, CKIs are regular. By SCF, right? So you're going to have APC and SCF active at different parts of the cell cycle, and they're degrading specific targets that are going to promote going going forward um, throughout the what phase of them. So latent M1, like I just said, um, CDC20 is ubiquitinated and degraded by APC CDH1, so the APC is still on. And then CDH1 is going to degrade skip 2. Oh my gosh, degrade skip 2, so that's regulating SCF. So then you have this low SCF activity, and that allows these CKIs to accumulate and keeps then keep the um, cycle CDKs off into G1. <coughs> Um, and so then as you go G1 into S, so here's G1 into S, skip 2, um, which is part of the SCF, is going to induce P27 degradation. That's the CKI. So then as you're going into S, your CKIs are going to be degraded by, um, by the SCF, and that allows your cyclin, S cyclin CDKs to become active. So it's this kind of back and forth, keep the right the right ubiquitin ligase on at the right time so that the right proteins are available so that you can move through cell cycle. Um, so APC activity is actually going to be off once F phase starts, right? Because you need that geminin to come back up so that you can prevent setting up for more DNA replication while you're going through F. So just kind of, you don't need to memorize the exact mechanisms because it's actually very complicated, but um, just kind of keep in mind the fact that there's all this, all these different levels of regulation in order to basically keep site, uh, CDKs active or not. And a lot of that is also controlled by the put in ligase. More importantly, the integrating the total protein. Or who thinks that you that all you put in does? Is, is involved in degradation of the Okay. Words that can be you. You're supposed to say ubiquitin is everything. Ubiquitin, repeat after me. <laughs> um, and ubiquitin is really important because without ubiquitin ligases, you would have no cell you would have no cell cycle control. Right? Okay. I guess we're, oh, we're really early. I should have thrown more slides on. Does anyone have questions, actually?